conversation. So as we are taking a minute or two here, I just want to say, again, I appreciate our listeners today. I know how busy everyone's schedule is. I'm going to take a minute. We've got a number of people that I think are looking or trying to dial in. So uh, we're going to give them a minute or two, uh, and uh, we'll get started here very shortly. But again, uh, today's webinar, uh, five things that drive up customer effort and how to fix them. I think we all, uh, as practitioners in the space, uh, have a lot of ideas and uh, commentary towards this, and hopefully some things we can all take away for best practices. Um, one thing I like to do at Execs in the Know with all of our uh, events is as much engagement and participation as possible. Um, so again, uh, I will tell our participants um, you should have on the WebEx platform under the Event Center, if it's up, there should be an area there that you can uh, ask questions uh, during the course of the webinar, and uh, I'll be very active at looking at the Q&A. Also, I do have a planned poll that I think will be interesting to get your guys' perspective and see the results. So uh, you'll want to make sure that you uh, can see on your dashboard the polling opportunity when I present that a little bit later on it. Um, Jane, are you with us right now? I just want to, Jane, I, I think you're, okay, good. Just want to make sure we've got you on audio. Jane, good morning, or good afternoon, I guess, depends on where we are. Um, and Mike, are you also with us? I am. Excellent. Okay. Well, um, I've got today's session is going to be recorded, so for those that are joining late, uh, obviously they can listen to the full recording as we proceed forward. Um, Jane, I'd like you to go to the next slide if you could, and I'm ready to get started uh, with today's session. So really, um, if you're not familiar with execs in the know, um, it's, it's been a passion of ours for a number of years now, but really it's a very large corporate community of brands, corporate brands that are sharing insights and best practices around today's customer equation. Uh, there are many things that within the, uh, the corporate community we share amongst each other. Uh, through multi-channel, omni-channel, emerging technologies, uh, best practices and insights. Um, I would encourage you to get involved with Execs in the Know. We are not a membership-based or an association, but a group of a large number of groups of brands that are sharing insights. There's a number of things that we do as a community. Um, we host a couple of national events. We have a lot of regional gatherings. And in addition to that, uh, we produce a number of insightful benchmark reports uh, that you can find under Execs in the Know. They are all free, downloadable under the Resources tab. Uh, these are the corporate insights and best practices and multi-channel. Uh, these research includes our vertical report on retail, the retail segment, uh, the travel segment, um, again, if you are looking for data and insights uh, for your community or your brand, uh, I hope you leverage Execs in the Know as your go-to source and community partner. So it is my pleasure and privilege to have your uh, time um, for today's discussion, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Jane, if you could go on to next, uh, if you could. So I asked, um, and I, Jane and Mike, I know how busy you two are, and I really, first of all, want to thank you. And I specifically asked you to kind of join Execs in the Know for today's discussion and really help us from a subject matter expertise and insights, because I think there's a number of things you guys not only are doing right within your brand, but the visibility that you're seeing and bringing. And I thought it would be great for our corporate community to leverage some of your insights. And um, I'm not, a Jane Mike, a big fan of reading bios, uh, but I'll give a quick uh, brief to our listeners. But maybe when you start to present, just a little bit more from your perspective about uh, your role and uh, focus in the marketplace. So, uh, Jane, you are the... Um, 
Vice President of Marketing for Interactions, and Mike Roach, you are the SAP of Operations. Both of you have, have uh, terrific insights in the industry. Uh, for our listeners, uh, you can look both Jane and Michael up on LinkedIn, and I would encourage you to connect with them. Reach out to them. Uh, they are committed to the execs in the know cause. They are committed to helping this industry move forward and grow, and I can't thank you enough. So um, if we could go to the next slide, uh, Jane. There's a couple housekeeping things. I just want to remind uh, all of our listeners, the presentation will be available after the webinar is over. Uh, this will be tomorrow. You'll be emailed out a link. Uh, which will include today's recording. Uh, I would encourage you to share this with your uh, internal brand. I encourage you to share this within your network as we're really trying to advocate the thought leadership and knowledge. Also, for our listeners, I really need your help. You're my customers. Uh, there will be a short Q&A period after the presentation. So um, I would ask you to uh, submit your questions as we go through. And finally, um, there will be a link that you'll receive a survey from today's session. Uh, you are my voice of the customer, and I really do need to hear your thoughts on today's webinar and suggestions for continued content and areas of improvement. So without uh, further ado, I want to we, – we've got a good topic to talk about today. I want to get started. Um, Jane, um, if you could, thank you so much for your time. Uh, maybe just a quick overview of your role and background, and then uh, and, and Mike also, and then let's get started. Sure. Um, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jane Price, and really happy to be here today. Uh, my uh, my role in interactions is is in marketing, but we focus on product strategy. Um, I have a background in consumer and B two B. And a lot of my career I've spent focusing on user experience, customer experience, customer satisfaction, and how to, you know, really engage uh, consumers in a way that's both meaningful and, and impactful. And, and that's, I think that's why I love interactions, um, because we're, we're doing that um, every day with all of our clients, and we're touching millions of consumers. And uh, my colleague, Michael Roach, do you want to say hello? Hey, everyone. Um, Michael Roach here. I Currently head up the operations group here at Interactions. Um, background is in contact center operations. And then at this company, at Interactions, I've been, um, had the good fortune of a number of different roles, uh, engineering roles um, under the sales umbrella, as well as services, and now um, running the, um, the operations into the business. Uh, so I've kind of watched this industry grow over the past 11 years or so, and it's been really interesting. And Chad, I'm going to jump right in if that's okay. Yeah, let's let's go. Thank you again. Yeah, no problem. So it's interesting as I was thinking back before starting this uh, about you know from whence we came. Um, back when I was in the contact center operations world, the notion of experience and CSAT and so forth was important, but uh, call deflection was more important. So uh, I think it was a buzzword, you know. Quite a few years ago, we did everything at all costs to move calls away from contact centers. And, and oftentimes, that was at the expense of customer experience, and that included um, increasing customer effort. Well, you know, we've certainly evolved since then, and we understand now that uh, customer effort and CSAT pay huge dividends down the line, that um, the extent to which companies present their customers with an easy path to task completion uh, yields uh, good things. Um, so to that end, um, Interactions actually, you know, a number of years ago was formed because some of the, the automation that we were putting in place throughout the industry was just not living up to its bill. In fact, it was creating more effort on the part of callers and more frustration. Um, uh, since that time, uh, being out on the road often, we've had a, a, really an opportunity to listen to your customers and and have had a further opportunity to do some research to figure out what their thoughts are and what they perceive to be problems as it relates to effort um, or even doing business with you. So we'll spend some time talking about that. But let, let's set the stage first. So two numbers to look at, uh, 40 and 10. 40 represents um, 
something pretty interesting actually. 40% of your customers are frustrated in some way before they ever reach out to you. This is really important to understand and to think through as you're designing um, your front end of the business, uh, regardless of channel. Knowing that your customers are irritated when they start the contact process um, will help you put in place things that uh, ease that uh, down the road. The other thing to think about is just number 10, and 10 refers to a time scale. You have about 10 minutes uh, to satisfy a customer request. Uh, beyond that, you start to deteriorate the experience and customers are unsatisfied uh, with the results, even if you come to some term. So Jane's going to talk a little bit more about these numbers, but it's important to think about this as we, we talk about the ways to potentially fix some of these problems. These are numbers to keep in mind, and we'll talk about that further. Um, this <laughs> this um, maze is meant to demonstrate or articulate in a very simple way what customers are perceiving. So regardless of what you put up in front of them, the overwhelming um, position that they take is that um, they are being led down the path of a maze to get something done. And this, if you walk in the door and you're already frustrated, having this put in front of you um, certainly exacerbates that problem. So. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Jane. Jane's going to talk a little bit about kind of, um, some, of the, some of the data behind effort and um, what your customers are saying. Thank you. Um, so, so I wanted to go through the studies that we've done today and then kind of just the set expectations. We've done a few studies. We want to walk through the data and how we got to some of the interesting information around customer satisfaction and customer effort. And then we're going to talk about some strategies and tips and techniques to start to figure out how to really address some of those or how to maybe think about them a little bit differently. So, um, you know, as, as Michael was saying, Interactions has a history and in, in a long history in customer care um, with a strong focus on really changing the way that businesses and consumers interact and trying to remove the frustration from those interactions and we're using technology to do that. Um, so, you know, not surprisingly, we're very interested in sort of the consumer point of view and how consumers either want to interact with companies or um, what it is that they feel is frustrating or not working. And we try to address that within our own client applications. Um, but then it's also, you know, it's also great information uh, to start to share as well. So what we're going to walk through or what I'll walk through in the first part of uh, this afternoon is is our two, the results from two studies uh, that we've done over the last 18 months or so. Uh, the first one was to take a look at consumer behavior and how consumers really want to communicate with, with the company, so what channels they want to, what they want to interface on, the, the, the way that they want to behave within that interaction, and some of the things that might cause them frustration in those, interaction, in those interactions. And that was fielded. Um, through Boston University. And then the second study that, uh, that I want to uh, walk through that we fielded more recently was sort of a follow-up to that, which is, okay, now that we know some of the parameters of how consumers want to communicate, what are they finding hard to do? What is um, the effect of effort, and how can we start to think about removing some of those? Uh, kind of to step back just a one little bit, you know, some of this comes from a reaction that we were having some internal conversations around uh, a concept that came out about a year ago, which was a lot of uh, people were talking about the customer care as a journey. And, you know, when we, when we kind of sit back and think about customer care as a journey, that sounds great from a marketing and business perspective. But when you're a consumer and you have about five minutes before your next meeting to make your kids a doctor's appointment, that's not what you want to be presented with. You want to be presented with a really efficient process. You want to make the call, make the appointment, and move on with the rest of the day. So this concept of journey is really something that we've been pushing back on and really focusing more on efficiency. So we started the, the, the session with the number 10. Um, and I'm going to just kind of go back to that in a little bit more detail. So 10 minutes is kind of the, the threshold uh, regardless of industry almost, of time that you have 
to, to get something done for your, for your customer, for your consumer. Um, and so you kind of, uh, when we did this survey, we looked across, you know, all industries and had consumers rate by type of transaction that they were performing, kind of their expectation. How much time did you set aside in your schedule, in your busy day, to um, deal with that banking transaction, to uh, call the doctor's office, to uh, find out if, why your package didn't arrive on time? So they're thinking in terms of the types of transaction and how much time they want to allot. And so 10 minutes really becomes sort of a benchmark. And the interesting thing here is within their thinking, this includes any sort of hold time or time spent waiting. It's, it's sort of the all-in number. Now certainly what was interesting here too is that there are definitely applications and even industries where you see that number trending higher. So if I have a complicated insurance claim or a, you know, more in-depth kind of financial inquiry, um, those are areas where consumers are definitely willing to put in more time and their expectation up front is that it's going to be higher going in. Um, so you can see kind of the, the, the um, healthcare and finance um, numbers you know, higher uh, in the 20 minute zone. Uh, the, the hard part is that if you're in retail, there's a, a big spike at five minutes and a big spike at 10 minutes. So consumers really have an expectation in retail that their problem is simple and it should be handled quickly. Jane, this is Chad. I was just thinking, gosh, I'd like to know who those customers are that will wait more than 30 minutes and how come they're not my customers? But <laughs> neither here nor there. It's an interesting correlation and, uh, and thresholds that you're showing in this slide. And again, for all our listeners, uh, you will get a copy of all these slides and recording from today's session. But please continue, Jane. Sorry. Yeah. And I, think, I think when you get down to that 30 minutes, they're thinking, you know, this is a tech support issue. You know, I know I'm going to be here for a while. It's going to, I'm going to run through the, through those, the paces and, and fix this problem. So it's really getting, it's getting longer. Um, those were the types of really complicated applications uh, or transactions that people were talking about at that high end. I wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> so um, the next, one of the other things that we looked at was kind of the correlation between or the, the, the idea of how much time did you uh, expect to put in and end up putting in and how much effort um, it was tied to that. And so, you know, the, the nice news is, is that there's a, you know, a nice cluster in the middle that felt like my time and effort was, was pretty on par. A smaller grouping that felt like my time and effort was less than expected, so they're walking away very, very happy. Um, but then, you know, I think what's troubling to me is that they're still, you know, almost uh, in the high 40s, close, closing in on 50% of consumers are saying that they're spending too much time and too much effort to get something done. So they have a scale, um, maybe even tied to their frustration level going in, that I'm going to put this much time and this much effort, and if you don't meet that, it's adding to the frustration and starting to decrease their, their perception of that brand interaction. I think the other thing to point out here that's interesting is that, you know, while I wouldn't call this a scientific correlation by any stretch of the imagination, it is interesting, and we believe it to be true based on kind of our analysis, that there is a direct correlation in many ways between customer um, effort and time, right? So those customers who, who believe they're spending too much time are also um, associating that with effort, and that plays heavy on their decision-making process down the road. Yeah. There's not, there's not like counting steps. That was one thing that, that kind of came through. How many times do they have to repeat? How many times do they have to, you know, get transferred or jump through hoops or whatnot? They're, they're counting those steps along the way. Uh, one, of, one of the big things that came up in both of the studies, kind of loud and clear, was, was a, you know, a pretty basic concept was to, you know, the idea of just treating me like a person. And, you know, what this translated into through the data and, and, and some of the um, focus group feedback of the first study was wanting the, the company to meet them on their terms, to be able to use um, their own language, their own words to get things done, um, to, to, to really, uh, you know, have, have this, the brand express some understanding of either the complexity of the problem or transaction that they're trying to resolve 
uh, and an understanding of the um, the use of that consumer's time and are they using it efficiently and in a respectful way. You kind of end up with um, lots of comments about consumers not wanting to have to learn the language of a system or consumers not wanting to have to be forced to go through um, multiple steps or to repeat themselves uh, because it, it takes sort of a human interaction out of that. Now, they're perfectly willing to communicate with automation as long as it's efficient and, and, it, and it bends to the consumer's needs. So there's a lot of having the, having the technology relate to the consumer as opposed to the consumer having to bend to the technology. Um, a large number, 45% of consumers, felt that, you know, a lot of the paths, a lot of the items that businesses are putting in front of them to get their uh, interactions solved or their, their, their transactions solved, were really trying to prevent them from reaching a human or, or from, from having to talk to a live agent, for example. So the, some of those, some of those uh, automation tools can be perceived as a bit of a push up back from consumers from actually getting to where they need to be. And if I could, I wanted to also just point out, you know, this last um, section on the left here about the language of the automated systems, it's, it's interesting that um, when you think about the consumer perspective on this, not so much our perspective as business leaders who are trying to get something done and be more efficient and, and you know, code something to work properly, the consumer's perspective on this is, uh, challenged for sure. Think of it this way, you know, each company that puts in place, let's just talk about the, the voice channel for a moment. Each company that puts in place some sort of automation at the front end of the voice channel does so differently. Um, you're, you're using different softwares. You're using directed dialogue if you're using speech or natural language. You're using um, different design principles. So each of those technologies has a core set of design principles. Um, the software itself is versioned differently, uh, even if it's the same. And moreover, I think more importantly, the, your business rules as companies are different. So what one caller might expect from one company in terms of business rules may or may not apply with the next customer service experience. Well, when you add those four factors together, the consumers are extraordinarily challenged at trying to figure out how to make these systems work. What do I say? Which is why we hear in the business things like agent or billing, because they're trying to fit what's in their mind into some small peg hole that they believe will work. That is a challenging thing to do in a kind of non-conversational or very unstructured environment that we are all putting in place in front of consumers. So uh, Michael and I were just actually talking about this, uh, this some of these points with a, a group uh, recently, and one of the things that that constantly comes up is a perception of channel speed, channel choice being driven by one of two things. So one is completely driven by demographics. You know, we depend, based on my my age, I'm going to want to relate to a company in a, uh, over a certain channel. Um, and that's the whole boomer, uh, you know, boomers like to call and millennials will text you and, and go online and, and use social channels to communicate with you all day. Um, the other is that, you know, from a business perspective, if I, if channel options grow, if I just continue to stand up more channels, I can easily move my consumers from one channel to the other. So if I want less people online, I can, you know, stand up my SMS tool. If I want uh, more people on on, uh, on chat, I can easily just stand up that, that chat tool. In reality, what was really interesting in the, in the, that came out in the survey results was that consumers are actually making strategic decisions about which channel to use, regardless of demographics, based on what they know about you as a brand. So it's either their prior experience in working with you and they found something that works, um, or it's because they've talked to their network, their friends, and, or have done some research online and decided that the best method of contact for the particular issue that they're trying to solve 
is the you know is the one <laughs> is the one that they're going to use. So, so it's more of a more of a strategy. Um, they're really putting some time into thinking about how do I want to approach this problem and what's the best way to approach it with the company. Now, the majority of care interactions, the first line of contact is still the phone, and roughly 53% today, at least from this survey, um, is on phone. Usually what happens though is there, you know, when, when I have to, when the first channel doesn't work, the second channel doesn't work, I end up calling in. And so you see the usage of phones increasing uh, depending on how effective the prior channels were that I, that I tried. So about 63% eventually end up on the phone and calling you and trying to resolve their issue. Jane. Um... Chad here, and I just want to interject, if I can, for uh, the listeners. You bring up some interesting points here, and, and again, Mike, I liked your correlation of effort and time, uh, some of the commentary you had. But what's interesting about your findings here in your study, uh, for our listeners, they're very, very consistent to what we're seeing in our research study when it comes to volume and channel and use of channel. Uh, over the last three, four years, we've consistently seen this um, where actually telephone is staying consistent or going increasing. Um, and with the adoption of a lot of channels being introduced by brands, in some cases it's actually driving up the telephone channel use. And there's a whole bunch of reasons to what may be causing that. Um, part of it is that uh, we've not done a good job of rolling out our channel strategies and we're frustrating our customers and they can't get resolution um, and they have to go to the telephone. I mean, there's many, many other reasons. Um, but I, I have a poll, though, I want to launch. But before I do that, Jane, do you have just any other commentary you want to say this before I launch the poll? No, go ahead. Okay. So... This is going to be, I really want to pull our audience in, and if why I'm pulling this uh, poll up here on my side, uh, just make sure if you can look for your dashboard where you have your polling option. I would love your engagement. So I'm going to go ahead and open the poll, but before I do that, the question is this. Um, what is the channel, it, the question says, what is the channel you use to first reach out to customer support? Clarity on that question is, um, what, is the, what is the channel your customers are reaching out to you for customer support? So the poll is now open. Uh, I'll just leave it for one minute. You should see there. There's uh, just please uh, pick one answer, phone, chat, email, social, text, other. Um, just want to get an idea from our audience, uh, is it consistent to what we're seeing in our findings? So again, what is the channel your customers are typically reaching out to you for support? And I know there's a bunch of feelings and thoughts and passion around this, and I also know there's a bunch of questions in the Q&A. We will get to those. So um, we've got just about 20 seconds left on the poll. Uh, if you could take a minute and uh, do that, and I'll close it here shortly and then share it with uh, our audience. Okay, so 10 seconds left. If you haven't got your uh, answer in, please do so. All right, 10, 2, 1, just waiting. All right, I just closed the poll. Um, and we're waiting just a couple more seconds here for the submitted responses. So I'm going to go ahead and show the poll results. Um, and just working this on my system, bear with me for one second, but it's fairly consistent to, I think, uh, what we're saying here. So um, hopefully you can see that on your screen now. So 62% are saying phone. 21% have said chat, 10% uh, email, 4% social media, and then uh, text zero, um, and then other two. Jane, again, Jane and Mike, any reaction to that before uh, I uh, stop the, the poll? No, it's interesting. We presented this data, uh, Chad, the other day, and uh, it was the 53%, and we had a, one of the folks in the audience kind of raise their hand and you know, just felt like that's too low. That feels low to me. And, uh, you know, always, you know, it was the product of the study. 
I continue to agree with him. It looks like that number is a little bit low for some reason. We continue to see it. If anything, it's higher, which is more telling. Um, it's directionally right, but uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, folks still use that channel so prominently. Yeah, and I think it speaks to that human interaction need that people are really looking for. They want a relationship with the brands that they do business with regularly. And, yeah. and you know, calling and communicating verbally, um, you know, building that relationship, feeling, you know, sure that the thing you got, uh, that you wanted to get accomplished was accomplished, you know, it, it kind of all plays together. I just want to say we've got to move on because we want to get about uh, how to, you know, how to improve customer effort and all of that or uh, customer frustration. But 62% uh, say phone, very consistent to some of the things. We could have a whole different conversation, Jane, Mike, about why that is and what predictions are. Uh, it's been great discussions within our community for a number of years. Uh, but it's fairly consistent. So um, let's move on. Thank you again for all our listeners for your participation in that. So, so on, the, on the previous slide, I started by saying, you know, demographics don't necessarily drive channel choice that is more strategic, and that's, that's true. But there are characteristics of the demographics that I think are important to keep in mind. Um, you, you know, the, the stereotype, for one, of boomers being reluctant to use any other channel than voice certainly came through in their response category, that they're they're definitely willing to change, capable of changing. They're just looking, they're just wanting to have that kind of uh, view from the company that, that there's, there's a better way to get something done than what they've been using. Um, when in doubt, people will default to the tried and true. Um, millennials came back as a cynical group, um, which is, you know, kind of probably puts a lot of them into that starting the conversation frustrated category. They uh, feel uncertain that they'll get the help that they need. Um, they're, they come in pretty sure that it's going to take a lot of time and that, they, that they, they might not get something resolved in one time. So really changing that millennial mindset and, you know, delighting them with fast division service is something that, uh, that they're hoping to see. Uh, millennials, you know, the interesting part about millennials is, is not their amazing ability to, to text that we all talk about. But it's, it's really that they're, they're spending a lot of time communicating, networking, educating themselves on whatever, the, whatever they're trying to solve. So if they have a technical support issue, or um, they're going to go online, they're going to research it on Reddit, they're going to ask their friends, they're going to read details. They might not even go to your website, but they're really going to try to figure out, one, if they can fix the problem themselves, um, and, then, and then two, what other people have encountered when trying to or when being up against that same issue, they're often looking for a community to actually feel that they're, you know, they're not in this alone. Um, they, the, the tricky part about that, though, is that when they do call in or text in or chat on your, online, they're five, six, seven steps down the road in their customer care solution. So right, starting them over at point A, um, is really an area of frustration for them. They really want the business to be able to jump to wherever they are in their process. If they know a lot of things, you know, they want to start there. We kind of liken it to, you know, if you have a computer issue and you call your IT department and the first thing the IT person says is, did you reboot it? And you're like, yes, I tried that 15, 15 times. That's why I'm calling you. Um, so it's, it's that kind of frustration that they see. And, you know, we'll, we'll see where the Gen Z crowd comes in. They're just entering the market right now. Um, all indications are they're, you know, using uh, outlets to learn and engage, um, highly social crew as well. So they may be close to millennials. We'll probably come up with some other um, complications for how to work with that generation, too. So one of the big questions is always, okay, so if something's hard, what does that really mean? Well, you know, when, when consumers uh, were asked, you know, how does this experience, how does this one individual experience with the brand that you were just working with impact your future purchase decisions from this company, 20% um, said that it hasn't impacted their decision, another 22% that they wouldn't purchase again from that company. But 
indicated that they're, they're, they're going to weigh their decision. So one interaction with a consumer really has an impact on future loyalty, future purchases, um, you know, your, your, your NPS score, your CPAS score. You really want to keep them, you know, feeling like you're making good use of their time and that you're helping them to get to where they need to be. You know, they, they, they viewed um, too much time and effort as you know, being too many steps or feeling like the business was trying to prevent them from actually communicating or engaging directly, um, or th thinking that the amount of time that they spent wasn't appropriate for the thing it, that they were trying to accomplish. So this, all of this, this idea of effort, really does have an impact on the, on the business. Um, the great news, what I always think of as the hope in all of this, is that when you look at that group that we talked about at the beginning, that felt like they spent less time and less effort on the task, that delight moment really has the potential to make for a long-term happy customer. Ninety percent of those consumers felt content, indicated higher customer satisfaction, indicated, you know, a positive affinity for the brand. So they're, they're more likely to, um, to continue to be happy customers going forward. Now we're going to move into how to fix some of these problems because I think that's that's um, that's the key here. And Michael, you're going to run through some of these. I am, yeah. So yeah, well, let me just jump right to the uh, to the next step. So I, I guess uh, the first step in in thinking through this is to define your your strategy and objectives for care. And while that seems maybe in some ways kind of obvious. Um, what you define clearly up front in terms of your objectives has a, um, uh, an impactful um, role in, in what strategy you're going to roll out. You know, it seems obvious that reducing cost is, would be part of any customer care strategy. In fact, you know, years ago, that was the number one strategy. But we are seeing customers now who, while reducing cost is clearly important, um, they're looking at it more holistically. And, um, maybe taking less of a, of a cost win um, to ensure that the customer experience is either, either protected or improved, right? So um, you think about brands, you know, there's a, a retail customer out there, for example, that I think we're all very familiar with, that elected to create a strategy that was you know, built around A, technology, and B, customer satisfaction different differentiation. So their experience, at the front end in their retail stores is like nothing we've ever seen before in the industry. They are, um, they you know, bring you into the store, they help you out quickly, they um, uh, have you pay on the spot with an agent, they'll make you go stand in line, et cetera. These are all efforts to differentiate themselves from others in the market and they've, they've really stood up. It's not just that company, it's many other companies that do similar kinds of things in terms of their customer care strategy. But this is, this is the leading edge, right? Identifying what that strategy is so that you can then um, uh, move forward and, and pick the right solutions that either reduce effort or overall improve uh, CSAT. So let's go to the next. So I'm going to be the first to admit this, this is a little hokey in terms of the visualization, but um, it is meant to be clear and simple and easy to execute and easy to repeat. So what we're doing here is thinking about the customer perspective. So down the left, left hand column, we have things that we want to track, um, length of transaction, channel consistency, is your, are your systems conversational, um, either voice or text, et cetera. Ideally, you know, as you self-analyze each of your, your contact points, you're, you'll rate yourself and you'll rate the things that you put in place in front of your customers. And then over time, as you augment those solutions or, or create new ones, the goal would be to slide these check marks to the right and end up in this, in this uh, final picture. Um, on the next slide, I, I, which you'll get, we're probably going to run out of time chat, so I'm going to skip this slide. But basically, you'll, you'll all have a copy of this, and I've kind of articulated what, what, each, of these, um, what each of these means. But, I guess the overall thing I'd, I'd like folks to think about is that, you know, you have designers of your voice systems or your chat systems or your SMS systems, your, your social systems, 
they should be thinking at every single turn, am I making the process easier or am I making the process harder? Am I adding effort or reducing effort? Um, we at Interaction focus on that with great care. Designers need to be thinking about that every moment of their lives. At every turn, that's how they should be thinking about this. Um, you know, the example I like to, um, to think through is, you know, oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this as well, when I was in contact centers, I would seek to authenticate callers because I wanted to know who they were. Every single caller, I wanted to know who they were so that I could track what they were doing in our systems and so forth. Um, so if a customer called and they wanted the mailing address to send a check, I would authenticate them first. Well, why? They don't need to be authenticated to answer that question, right? So if your business can afford not to do that, if that is not a critical item, it's an example of a step that you could take out, right? So you know, basically asking customers only for information when it's required for them to do the next step, not, not when uh, it's helpful for a report that somebody may or may not look at. So, Good. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's interesting when, again, kind of thinking back to the conversation we were having the other day um, with a with with larger group, um, there's a lot of steps that kind of come up that end up being because of business business rules or, or businesses wanting to have, you know, additional information or just this is our process, this is how we do it. And I think if you kind of flip it and to the point of this exercise that we highly recommend, you know, to kind of think about what are the things in there that we're doing, you know, that are really for the business and maybe could be changed. And what does that look like from a consumer point of view? Is that going to negatively impact them in some way? In other words, am I, am I, am I creating complication for the sake of the company and not thinking in terms of, of the consumer experience? Right. I and mean, sometimes it's required, right? Security protocols sometimes require that we go down steps that we wouldn't otherwise go down. But, you know, I guess the point is, if you do self-analysis of these systems, is there anything that we can take out? Do we really need this from a design perspective? Yeah. One of the other things I just wanted to point out on this chart that I think is really important to rate on, because it, it came up a lot uh, in some of the focus groups and feedback, feedback within the studies, was this idea of channel consistency. And, you know, I know a lot of companies are really working to put more and more context methods, context channels in place today. And a lot of what consumers were, were, viewing, were seeing, however, was that the channels weren't all the same, you know, and not that they all can be exactly the same because the way you text, talk, and type might be a little bit different. But what they're looking for is, can I do the same set of stuff when I call versus when I chat? versus when I text. And, and when they hit those kind of moments where their experience is different and they recognize that, you know, I could do that here, but now I can't do that here, it really was a moment of frustration for that consumer because now they've got to pour everything that they've just done over to the channel that they know can, can actually do that task. So one thing to really, you know, sit back and think about as we light up all these new channels is, or providing a consistent experience in terms of functionality across all of those. Which actually is a great leading chain for the next item, which is to, uh, to know your channels. Um, yeah. So um, well, we were at a conference, actually Jan and I were at a conference earlier this week, and you know, one of the quotes that stuck out to me was uh, that business leaders all believe that AI is, is something that uh, we're going to need to do. Um, Knowing that, uh, I think organizations need to think very practically about what they can do and when they can do it, whether it's budget or technology or you know, allocation of technical resources, et cetera. Um, you have to think long and hard about you know, what channels are, um, are available to you and, and when to implement them. But in terms of kind of that first step, how are customers reaching you today, when you think about that channel, and let's assume it's voice for a moment based on the data that we saw, the question to ask is, is that channel pristine? So before you think about opening up two or three more channels for the sake of opening up channels, is the phone channel pristine? Have you done everything you can to make that a great place for customers to reach out to you? And when you've kind of satisfied that, then you can move on to the next question, which is, you know, how would you like them to reach out to you? And moreover, 
how do you think your particular demographic or your customer base wants to reach out to you? Then that becomes your channel strategy for the next, the next rollout. I think it's important also, though, to consider transactionally um, before you just jump into a channel, you know, what kinds of transactions are you trying to automate and are they appropriate for that particular channel? Not all transactions are appropriate for all channels, whether that's because, you know, the nature of the data would suggest that it's not great for someone speaking it out loud in, a, in an environment or there's a million reasons why certain channels are better than others for execution. So just think about that as well. And then, I guess, finally, how do I direct customers to the, to the right path? And, you know, that becomes part of your strategy, whether that's leveraging, you know, multiple channels to do the same thing, like um, at Interactions, many of our applications leverage SMS to help customers um, go to other channels, right? So leveraging SMS to build a knowledge bases or what have you to resolve their problems. Those are kind of tactics and efforts to allow customers to self-serve um, in, in an easy way. Mike, I guess uh, Mike, I was just going to jump in chat here is that, um, first of all, I'm glad this is recorded. I could not agree more than what you just said on this particular slide. Uh, I'm not an advocate of just having channels for the sake of having channels. Um, uh, you know, you've got to obviously have a strategy in mind and, uh, you know, understand some of the insights that you've described. But I would add to Mike that not only know your channels, uh, but know your customer in the sense because each brand is so different and it's hard to put apples and oranges and different, you know, comparisons together. But at the end of the day, know your customers and know your channels because an organization may look inherently very different over here and, you know, we can't always assume everything is a common. So, um, anyhow, I, I love that slide, love the commentary, and uh, I'll turn it back over. Great. No, thanks for that input. Um, I, I guess the other, the final thing on this is, and it probably should be up here, um, but, you know, know your own back-end systems, too. I can't tell you how many times in the engineering role here at Interactions we, we were working with companies trying to do self-service uh, across various channels, but their back-end systems didn't support that. Whether they weren't stitched together or they weren't, the APIs weren't there to support uh, particular transactions, I mean, we, it goes back to this notion of if I'm going to open up a channel and it's consistent from channel to channel, I have to offer the kinds of things that somebody would go and try to execute on. If the API is not there to do that, then don't waste the time, effort, energy. You're, it's just going to end up being a frustrating experience for the caller. Good. Thank you. So the last um, thing I'm going to talk about, at least today, is um, to think through human versus technology. So, you know, when you're, when you're creating these customer care plans and you're thinking about, you know, okay, well, how do I, what tasks belong with a human and what tasks belong with um, automation, in the past, you know, we used to use terms like, okay, well, focus on the simple tasks or focus on low-hanging fruit. And, you know, that was certainly a requirement uh, in the past, but technology has evolved. We shouldn't worry about that so much anymore. We should be driving those technologies to do more complex things. I think where, where we have come from a, from a technology perspective allows us to really stretch what we used to do as compared to what we can do now. Um, when I think of agents and when I think of the things that are suited to an agent, I think about why we hire humans. We hire humans because they're empathetic. Um, so when you have tasks that require empathy, those are the kinds of things that are best left in the hands of a human. Things like comparative. So I want to compare last, bill to, last month's bill to this month's bill. That's not something well designed for automation. That takes a human being to stare and compare and and, and really walk through some fairly complicated matter. Those, those are the kinds of activities that when, you, when you're kind of mapping out what is best for automation versus for humans, those are the kinds of questions that really need to be asked. Um, and again, you know, for those of you who are about to embark on kind of the, the automation strategies, you know, hold your vendors to a high standard um, because the technology is sufficient now to do much more than it used to do. Um, I think, um, the next slide is uh, about aligning brand with strategy, and since Jane heads up our marketing department, she's probably far more suited than I am to talk about this. 
Well, um, I'm sure you could do a wonderful job on it. But, um, you know, I think, I think the, the last kind of uh, piece that we wanted to discuss here was this idea of making sure that how you're communicating with your consumers is, is really in line with the brand experience and the brand, your brand strategy, how you want um, your consumers to perceive you and what you want that interaction to be like. Um, and make sure that the brand name is central to that interaction. There's a lot of um, channels that are popping up that become an intermediary between um, your brand and that customer interaction. You know, when you think about uh, the home-based devices um, and, uh, and some of the online channels that are available as well, those become the, the, the brand interface. Um, a lot of it is on the sales side today, but I think it's an important piece to keep in mind is maintaining your brand identity, the idea that the consumer is working directly with you to either purchase or for that customer experience interaction and not have an intermediary experience in the way. There's lots of ways to manage that um, interaction, you know, is focused on making sure that the brand comes through um, in voice and tone and even on those intermediary channels um, so that you maintain that brand experience as well. Yeah, and I would say, Pat, you know, that is a, the effort really plays into that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think consumers think of it in terms of that was a difficult transaction from an effort perspective. They think about it like, I had a hard time dealing with that company. That was, uh, there was too much effort with that company. That's the notion that they're left with. It's not transactional, it's associated with the brand. So those you know, negative effort scores are, are high, when consumers are forced with high effort interactions, and that has a negative impact on the brand that will play out down the road. Mm -hmm. Great, so I think the, the kind of the last piece that we put in this process here is that you know, as you, as you rate yourself, as you kind of think about what are, the, what are the complexities that are in your customer care strategy today and define that new strategy um, and start to execute on it, you know, the, 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 the wash, rinse, repeat <laughs> concept, you, you, you need to be evaluating yourself often. Are there, th are there ways to improve? Are there roadblocks that I didn't anticipate? Is the, the great new, you know, kind of uh, channel that I stood up, is it really performing? as optimally as expected? Is it, is it enhancing or detracting from my customer care experience? And so kind of continually going back and rating yourself and making sure that you're meeting your objectives um, is, is key. Um, make, those, make those KPIs, not just a one-term time uh, look for you. And that's it that we had. Um, our contact information is here. Uh, you know, we appreciate the time today. I think we're here for some, a few minutes of questions, if there are questions from, from the group. Um, but we, uh, we've enjoyed going through the study with you all. Well, that went fast. Um, thank you very much. And I do have some questions from the audience, and I've got some reminders and uh, some commentary for sure. So we'll leave, we'll, let's leave this slide on here so people know how to, and I would encourage our listeners, please, any questions, uh, Jane and Michael are more than willing to try to help the community, help the success and growth, and uh, uh, great people and uh, got good perspectives from their insights. So I would really encourage you to uh, feel free to directly reach out. Um, I'm going to jump into some uh, questions, and thank you for those that have come in. One from our listener group, uh, Jane Mike, uh, is would it be appropriate to use AI on an IVR platform to improve a telephone platform, if that makes sense? Um, again, any reaction, thoughts, commentary on that uh, from your perspective? Yeah, so without – it's Michael speaking. So, so without knowing a little bit more about exactly what – what that is, it's a little bit challenging to answer, but generally, it's an easy question to answer. It's absolutely. So, you know, how you're leveraging that AI technology on the, the voice platform and kind of how that's all integrated, you know, is a little bit dependent. But certainly, um, you know, AI technologies are now at a place um, where you should expect a ton of automation and in a very customer-friendly and conversational way uh, to help customers uh, before they reach agents. And, you know, one way to think about it is 
and certainly the way we think about it is not in terms of deflection, but in terms of deflecting minutes. So you know, your, audit, your AI should be able to automate, if not you know, an entire call, certainly portions of calls to take minutes out of your centers. And they should do so in a way that it does not negatively impact these that. In fact, you know, you're hoping for a tick up because you're making things more efficient. Yeah. And, and my guess probably being a little bit modest, I mean, that's, that's what Interactions does. I mean, we're using AI technologies for voice, um, for consumer customer care and voice in, in all channels, actually. Um, and, you know, we've really been focused and are passionate about applying technology that really works um, and allows for these more human uh, conversations, these more human interactions um, that are really efficient and help people get things done. Well, great question. Thank you, and thank you for the clarification on it. Another uh, listener, uh, I'm just trying to get through some of the questions that have been texted to me and also on our Q&A uh, board here. Um, how, and this kind of goes back to the earlier part, I guess, of the presentation, Mike. Um, how do time and customer effort relate on phone time? And um, asking, for example, if I solve in less than five minutes, is my effort score lower? So how do time and customer effort relate on phone time? Any quick insights or expansion on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, we always hate to say there was a direct correlation because that, that wasn't the way the phone study was designed. It'd be great to, for us, you know, kind of have it as the follow-up. But you can definitely see the pattern within the data, that the longer the, longer the conversation, um, the longer, you know, the higher the effort rating was. So there's a, you know, there's a, so there's perception or actuality, this idea that there's more steps in a longer conversation um, is, is definitely there. So it, you know, when you kind of look at the bars, they tended to be very close, the time and effort scales for consumers. So if you have a very short um, customer interaction, there's a tendency to believe that the amount of effort that I had to extend, the amount of time that I put into that, um, the number of steps in that transaction, kind of all go together. Um, so the data indicated that, um, but, you know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't state it on, on scientific numbers at this point. I, I could add to that a little bit in that I think that's one thing that Jan and I are hearing because we're spending a fair amount of time out of the market right now is that, you know, the extent to which you can add some level of predictability into the um, experience uh, can lessen that that effort dramatically as well. So, and I'm not just talking about any lookup and and um, knowing who that person is, but if you can connect channels and know that that person was just on the website trying to order something, or uh, and then they called in, those kinds of things where you can then reach out to the, ca the caller and predict, and then proactively approach the the caller as to what the nature of the call was and and how can how can you help, um, that reduces effort and certainly improves the overall. Um, Satisfaction. Okay. No. And again, thank you for continued uh, clarification and thoughts on that. Um, I, there, there's another, more of a comment. I don't know if there's a reaction to this, and I've got a couple other text questions that I want to make sure I get to for you folks um, uh, quickly here. But one of the comment was, uh, one of our listeners said, it's frustrating when businesses use voice systems as gatekeepers for class of service. IG preferred customers jump to the front of the queue. Not really an expansion on that comment, but I, I just wanted to know um, if you had any reaction or thoughts to that particular comment. Yeah, um, because of the nature of the systems that we put in place, we see these kinds of things regularly. And each business has their own rationale and their own requirement and reasons for doing that. I, you are correct, whoever wrote that though, that Certainly from a consumer or caller perspective, unless you happen to be in that VIP group, um, that is having a negative impact on your experience. Um, so I, would, I would just have to agree, I guess, with the comment. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep rifling a couple here, so we'll keep our as concise as we can on our responses. Um, one, of, uh, one of our listeners is asking, uh, Jane and Mike, for your thoughts on what are your thoughts on going straight to AI? in comparison to learning from a live chat and then transferred to AI? Great, great question. <laughs> uh, any thoughts or? It, it, is a great, it is a great question. Um, I don't think you have to do the steps, right? Um, so, I don't, and I don't mean to plug interactions too strongly here, but 
you know, we use a combination of artificial intelligence and human understanding. And so, actually, our applications learn as you go. So I don't, I don't think you have to compromise on that, on that step and say, I'm going to learn from a whole bunch of chats, I'm going to learn from a whole bunch of calls. There are ways that, and we've been in business trying to perfect this concept of going with AI from, from the start, you know, and, and, and really um, being able to leverage the, uh, the, 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 the data that's, that already exists as well as, you know, the on-the-fly learning that the, that the human element, the human understanding can be used in, the, in, mach, in a machine learning loop to uh, help to make the AI smarter. And um, would love to follow up with that person if they want to they want to continue that conversation. So Jane and Mike, thank you. And what I'm going to recommend, I was not able to get through all the questions, and I know everyone's got schedules, and I've got a couple more things I need to share with our listeners. Um, maybe the questions, there were more questions that came in that we couldn't answer. Maybe I can get them. And part of our follow-up is if there's a way that a quick written response from you folks, and we can pass that as a follow-up as part of today's conversation, something like that. Obviously, there seems to be great interest in this topic, and uh, thank you, but uh, do you think that could be suitable? Absolutely. Okay. So um, we'll make sure we follow up with our listeners for that. Can we just go quickly to the next slide um, that I had here on our, our deck? So basically, um, just a reminder to our listeners, uh, we're going to uh, have a, a great uh, powwow. Next slide here. Uh, we host twice a year our national leadership forum called the Customer Response Summit. Uh, it's going to be September 19th to the 21st. Uh, we've got some great announcements, and if you really want to come out and be with people in like-minded perspectives and sharing and insights, you've got to come to one of our summits. They are absolutely dynamic, and really we take everyone through kind of a two-day journey. Uh, we're very well uh, connect with each other. There's great experience and great outcomes. Uh, people that have been uh, really enjoy the summits. Um, if we could go to the next slide um, that we have on here. Um, also, quickly, just stay connected. Um, if you have not been to Execs in the Know website, if you go under the Resources tab, you will find our corporate and consumer series. It's called the CXMB series. These are free, downloadable, very, very detailed insight uh, reports or you can even find our Insights by Vertical. We produce two of them, travel, hospitality, and retail. If you're in those segments, I would strongly encourage you to look at those insights. Great, great data. They're free. They're downloadable on our site. You also can look at our other uh, blog series and, and other things like that. So. In conclusion, on behalf of Execs in the Know, I want to really thank you for today. Please continue to email us or write out to us, let us know uh, topics of interest and need. Jane and Mike, you were terrific guests. I cannot thank you more than enough to come and help our community learn and experience and engage together. I look forward to continuing to leverage your subject matter expertise and insight. So with that, I am now going to officially close today's webinar session. You all have a great rest of the week, and thank you again for today's session.